Good morning. Can you hear me now? Good morning. And welcome to worship at Lindsay United Methodist Church. We thank you for being here. If you are listening on the radio, if you are streaming, uh, we thank you in whatever form you are uh, choosing to join us today. Have a few announcements. Uh, the 17th, that's tomorrow, we're going to feed the Lindsay High School baseball team lunch, so it's set up in the Percy Hall there. Uh, contact Barbara for more information or to volunteer. Huh? Theresa. Contact Theresa. Sorry, for more information or to volunteer. The United Women of Faith will meet on Tuesday the 18th, that's the day after tomorrow, at 9.30 a.m. Next Sunday, we have a couple of things I want to bring to your attention. The first is the citywide offering for the Ministerial Alliance. Uh, we will take up uh, a collection for that, and I think that that may be their only fundraising event that they have, or very few. And get to, okay, we will have a, a singing event then that you can also uh, donate for that. But next week we will we will take up collection for the Ministerial Alliance. A hundred percent of the money that is collected for the Ministerial Alliance goes to help people who are in need. Uh, groceries, uh, utility bills, uh, those who uh, have no other means uh, to take care of those things, we as a community try to provide that. Uh, the second thing is the church membership informational meeting that will happen next Sunday afternoon at 2 p.m. Uh, we sent letters out. <clears throat> Hope that you uh, got those and read it, and we uh, asked for your attendance at that. It's very important for uh, this church. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Greetings from the risen Lord Jesus Christ, and as we enter into worship, may you feel the presence of the Holy Spirit inhabiting the praises of this day. So let us stand together and sing number 304, Easter people, raise your voices. <coughs> Easter people, raise your voices, sounds of heaven in earth should bring. Christ has brought us Heaven's choices, heavenly music, let it ring. Alleluia, alleluia, Easter people, let us sing. Fear of death can no more stop us from our pressing. join together in our call to worship. Almighty and everlasting God, you established the new covenant of reconciliation in the mystery of Easter. Grant that all who have been reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body may show their faith in their lives. You delivered us from the dominion of sin and death. You brought us into the kingdom of your Son. At, by Jesus' death, he recalled us to life. By his love, may he raise us to joys eternal, now and forevermore. Amen. Now let's sing, How Great is Our God. It's in the worship and song book number 3003. darkness. 
darkness tries to hide, it trembles at his voice, it trembles at his voice. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. If you'll join with me in the affirmation of faith found in your hymnal on page 881. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose dead, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God and Father Almighty. From hence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. any children in the uh, congregation today or anyone who'd like to be young at heart? <laughs> we'll just skip right on over that then, seeing one who doesn't quite qualify. <laughs> All right, we'll come together now to collect our uh, gifts to the Lord, our tithes and our offerings. And if the ushers would come forward for the morning offering, um, your offering supports this church and all the ministries that do in our we do in our community and in the world. And so, um, thank you for that. Without your financial support, the message of Jesus Christ would not be going out from us anyway in Lindsay. And uh, our special offering today is for capital improvements. That includes the uh, update of the electrical system here in the sanctuary so that we can replace the air conditioning systems in the sanctuary and in the gym. And in, um, if you'd like to be a part of that, just put capital improvements on your envelope or on your check. Will you please join me in prayer? Gracious God, we thank you for the gifts you've given us and the opportunity to return just a little bit back to you for your glory in your kingdom. Bless it to that end. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Beautiful. Thank you, ladies. You make that look so easy, but I can see your arms going everywhere like you have an extra pair. Please stand for the doxology. the time where we get to share our joys and our concerns. And I uh, just want to say thank you to all who participated in the Easter photo after worship last Sunday. That was a beautiful thing. (laughs) Um, In addition to the prayer requests that we have on the back of your bulletin, I would like to lift up the family of Jewel Keeler, the family of Amy Schoolfield. Um, We also want to remember Nita Butcher, Baby Creed, Jacob Lohman, and Emily Stone in our prayers. Let's go before the Lord in prayer, shall we? Gracious God, you are the creator of the universe. You made everything that there is so that we can exist, and we thank you so much for that, for making this place perfect for human life and for animal life and all of the life that there is on earth. Oh, Lord, we confess that we have not done your will, um, and we ask that you would forgive us and free us so that we can be in full relationship with you. And we thank you that through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we can do that. You are faithful to forgive us. Father, we pray for those who are ill this day, for those who are recovering from disease, from surgeries. We pray, Lord, for those who are... um, feeling isolated and depressed, and we ask that you would come alongside them and fill them with your hope and your love and your presence to let them know that they are not alone. We pray for those who are grieving the loss of loved ones this day. We're joyful that they are now in your presence, healed and fully back to the way they were created to be, and we just pray that your presence would comfort their families in this loss and walk with them on this journey. We pray for police officers, firefighters, school teachers, and administrative staff, for military at home and around the world. And we pray, Lord, for their protection from people who would do them harm. We also pray, Lord, that you would give them wisdom, that as they have to make quick and swift decisions, that you would give them the clarity to make the correct decision when it needs to be made. We pray for Christians around the world who are not fortunate enough to come together in safety to worship you this day. We ask that you would be with them and help them to be bold in their witness. Um, You have told us to share the gospel with the world, and we just pray, Lord, that you would help the people who need to have uh, the opportunity to worship you publicly and safely can do so. We pray for this church, Lord. Um, we just ask that you would open our eyes and our hearts to where you are leading us for the future. Um, Help us to be bold and courageous to follow you because there's not any safer place to be than in the midst of a leap of faith. And when we follow you, that's where we are. Help us to continue to be your hands and your heart and your feet in this community so that your kingdom will flourish here in Lindsay and throughout the world. In all things, we give you glory and honor and thanks and praise as we join together now to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Will you 
please stand as you are able for the scripture reading. It is Matthew 26, 16 through 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw them, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. May God add a blessing to the hearing and understanding of this holy word. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Will you please join me in prayer? Lord, open our ears to hear, our eyes to see, and our hearts to understand the message you have for us today. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, there was an abbot of a monastery, and he called the novice into his office and instructed him that he was going to be given the homily at the next morning's chapel. Well, the novice was struck with fear, and there was no way he was going to do it. But the abbot insisted. So the next morning, chapel came. He stood in the pulpit. The brothers were there. His hands were trembling. His knees were knocking. His voice was quivering. There was a long pause before he first spoke, and he asked a question. Do you know what I'm going to say? Well, they had no idea. So all of their heads went back and forth, in, almost in unison, as if they were choreographed. And he says, neither do I. Please stand for the benediction. Well, the abbot did not appreciate this. So he called the young novice into his office and said, you must do this. It's for your own good. Tomorrow is your day again. Be prepared, and this time do it right. Well, the next day was almost an exact repeat of the day before. All the brothers sat there before him. His hands shook, his knees knocked, his voice trembled. There was a long pause. Do you know what I'm going to say, he asked. Well, after the previous day's experience, they had a pretty good idea. All of their heads went, yes, we know what you're going to say. Well, then there's no need for me to tell you. Let's stand for the benediction. Well, the abbot was angry beyond description. He brought the young man into his office and said, if you do that again, you're going to be in solitary confinement, bread and water for 30 days, and any other punishment that I can think of. Tomorrow morning, give the homily, do it right. Well, the third day, chapel attendants hit a high. They were all there to see what he would say, and it was again almost an exact repeat. He stood, trembled. His voice quivered, and after the long silence, he asked, Do you know what I'm going to say? Well, after three days of this, about half of them had a pretty good idea, and they nodded their heads up and down. Yes, we know. But the other half had noticed the switch from day to day, and they really weren't sure what was going to happen. So they shook their heads back and forth. No, we don't. Well, the novice observed this, and then he said, Let those who know tell those who don't. Let's stand for the benediction. This is a simple definition of evangelism. Those who know telling those who don't. A simple definition, but in some ways adequate. A fully biblical definition of evangelism is the making of more disciples for Jesus Christ. Matthew gives us the most detailed version of the Great Commission. First, Jesus declared to the disciples that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. Then he gave the commission and the command, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That's a Trinitarian reference here, in case you missed it. 
and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Then he affirmed to the disciples that he is with them always to the very end of the age. It's tempting to ask you, like the novice did, if you know what I'm going to say. You guys are in luck. I'm going to say it anyway. Let's begin by noticing what's called the Great Commission. It's actually sandwiched between a great affirmation on the one hand and a great promise on the other. The great affirmation is that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now that Jesus has passed his test and proven himself worthy, all authority is his. As the scriptures and the songs say, he is the Lord of heaven and earth. At this time, he is still in sync perfectly with the Father and will fully exercise his authority on earth when he returns in glory. In the meantime, we know that he has the right and the authority to send us as his emissaries. I like that word, emissaries. That's how the word apostles is rendered in the complete Jewish Bible. You could also say ambassador, envoy, or representative. I like that idea. On my business card, I could write, Reverend Wendy Percival, ambassador for the kingdom of heaven. It's pretty cool. Not that I'm into titles or stuff like that. The commission is simple. Go and make disciples of all nations. The good news is for the world, the cosmos, and it is very inclusive. Salvation is for everyone and free to all. No one is beyond God's grace. They must simply accept the gift, and sadly, many do not. But our role is not to force people to believe. It's simply to share the good news and live our lives in obedience to Jesus' commands so that people can observe the difference. Once again, Jesus' commands are simple, but not easy to put into practice for a multitude of reasons. Once we've shared the good news and the person has believed, the next step is to teach them to obey everything Jesus commanded. So let's start with a big one, the great commandment. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. The expert in the law tried to trap Jesus by asking, who is my neighbor? And Jesus answered with the parable about the good Samaritan. But the simple answer is, everyone. I think it's also important to explore what Jesus meant by love. In our language, love has come to mean many things. We don't really grasp the deeper meaning of the great commandment if we don't understand what Jesus meant by this word. The Greeks had eight words for love. And I've heard that the reason the New Testament was written in Greek is because God knew it was one of the most precise languages of humankind. God could speak to the world precisely to better explain his message. The Greek words for love are eros, which means romantic and sexual passion, phileia, which is intimate, authentic friendship, ludus, which is playful love, Pragma, which is committed, companionate love. Philatia is the love of self. Storge is the love of family. Mania is obsessive love. And agape, selfless, unconditional love. I believe that even a novice Christian or even a non-Christian can figure out from that list what kind of love is meant by Jesus' command. Many of you have heard about agape love, and some of you may even have a really good understanding of it. We've really sanitized the word love. Most of the meanings it has now encompass things that we like, a positive feeling, it makes the world go round, or love is love. But agape is not always like that. Agape can be a pain in the neck. It can be brutal. Agape is a love that gives unconditionally to those who may not deserve it or want it, and it expects nothing in return. Lisa, this is for you. <laughs> I have a friend who loves to give gifts, 
And she gives wonderful gifts to many people. She expects a thank you note in return. If you do not write her a thank you note, you will never receive another gift from her. And of course, a thank you note, you should write. That's not really a gift though, is it? She expects the payment of a thank you note. Now I do understand the expectation of receiving a thank you response because it is hard to continue to give something of value to people who either act as if the gift is owed to them or who never even acknowledge it at all. But a gift is unconditional and it expects nothing in return. Agape is like that. Our society and even our communities of faith focus on loving others. I've seen dozens of posts on Facebook about how many times Jesus said, love one another. Yes, he did. This is important and a part of our obedience to Christ. It's not the only part though. The last six commandments teach us how to start loving others by honoring our parents. No murder, no adultery, no theft, no lying, no coveting. Now that doesn't sound so hard, does it? And of course, Jesus came to make all things easier for us, don't you think? Not exactly. Yes and no. <laughs> it's both and, like many things of our faith. Rather than making these commandments easier to keep, Jesus made them much harder. And it can only be done through the gift of God's grace. Not only are the actions forbidden, even the thoughts that precede the actions are forbidden. For example, no murder includes our thoughts. If we hate another person or are even angry with them, God considers that to be murder. And no adultery includes looking at lustfully at another person, real, CG, AI, or imaginary. This even applies to relationships before marriage because you are cheating on your future spouse. That's pretty harsh in our culture and in our world. And the only way to make it happen is through self-sacrificing agape love. I don't think it can be done outside the power of God. And we also seem to believe that loving another person always means saying yes or approving of anything they want to do. I don't think that's the case. It is not loving to knowingly give someone the money to purchase the drugs that will take their life. It is not loving to make excuses for someone who's violent. It is not loving to allow someone to abuse you. It is not loving to lead a person to believe that God does not care about how they lead their lives. Jesus said we must speak the truth in love and notice that the truth comes first. Do you remember the topic of the sermon that Jesus first preached and many of the others that followed? It is repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. The complete Jewish Bible puts it this way, turn away from your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. It's always important to start with ourselves and turn away from our sins. You might remember that when I first became active in my faith, God began to nudge me about my sins, and the one that rose to the top of the list was my mouth. It was pretty foul. While I rarely used God's name in vain, I did have a wide vocabulary of other curses and vulgar words, and I used them a lot. I also had a great repertoire of dirty jokes that I could share at a moment's notice on just about any topic. I was trying to be popular and funny, but in God's eyes, I was not achieving either. It was hard. It is still hard. And those jokes still pop in my mind at an appropriate time, but I am much farther along the road to the Lord than I was, and I'm much better able to um, resist the temptation to share, although I fall every once in a while. It reminds me that when I curse or tell a dirty joke, it tarnishes how God appears to others because people know I'm a Christian. It reminds me that while I can't change somebody else's vocabulary, I can gently let them know how completely offensive it is 
to use God's name in vain. I'm not fond of any coarse language, but you can let the S words roll as long as you do not misuse the name of the Lord in my presence. In our society, it's becoming more and more popular not to hold people accountable for their actions. No bail, no real consequences. Perhaps this is an effort to be more loving to others. And once again, it is not loving to either the aggressor or the victim. Love forgives all wrongs, but forgiveness does not entail the removal of consequences. But that's not really the main point of Jesus' teachings. All too often, we skip to the second greatest commandment and overlook the first, to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our strength, and with all our mind. In John 14, 15, Jesus says, If you love me, keep my commands. This is the first step in obeying Jesus' commands, and it goes hand in hand with his first sermon, to turn away from your sins and turn to God. Complete obedience to the second greatest commandment will not get you too far if you neglect the first. As Christians, we must teach others how to love God completely with the same kind of agape love that he gives to us. So how does one love God completely? Well, as with many things of the faith, it's a simple thing, but it's very hard to do. The Ten Commandments give us a start here on how to love God. No other gods. No idols. No blasphemy. Remember the Sabbath day. It means that our hearts are always putting God first. Our minds are always thinking about God first. And our actions and words are always bringing glory and honor to God. It means we study the scripture to know how to live our lives to please the Lord and to put that in action. If you know that God wants you to worship him on Sunday morning, every Sunday morning, and you worship him two to three times a year, then you have not put your knowledge into action. If you know that God wants you to be truthful and you knowingly mislead others, then you have not put your knowledge into action. You might not think that matters in our relationships with others, but it does. Most people know that you claim to be a Christian, and they're watching you. I've read several articles about why people don't believe in God or don't go to church. Many of the stories have to do with people who claim to be Christians but didn't act like it, and it raised a barrier between someone and the Lord. We can do something about that, and it's to start with ourselves by obeying the greatest commandment. Jesus taught many other things, and we find them by studying the word. That includes the Old Testament because Jesus is there also from the very beginning. Being a part of worship and being a part of a Bible study are critical to growing in your faith. John Wesley famously said, there's no holiness but social holiness. He was not speaking of social justice. The full quote is, solitary religion is not to be found there. Holy solitaries is a phrase no more consistent with the gospel than holy adulterers. The gospel of Christ knows of no religion but social, no holiness but social holiness. Faith working by love is the length and breadth and depth and height of Christian perfection. We learn how to love God and how to love others in community. And when we learn how to do this and put this into action, we can teach others as Jesus commanded in the Great Commission. Of course, we can share our faith with others before we're perfected in this, and we can invite them to our community of faith to learn together. And the Great Commission is followed by a great promise, and lo, I am with you until the end of the age. I love this. We are not on our own, doing our best to obey Jesus. He's with us. He lives in us, right here, right now. And he gives us the power to do it. All we have to do is share the news freely with those who need to hear it. Just pray and look for divine appointments to share Jesus. You'll find them everywhere if you open your eyes. At the end of World War II, Robert Woodruff, who was the president of Coca-Cola at the time, had a mission. He declared, in my generation, 
It is my desire that everyone in the world have a taste of Coca-Cola. With a vision and a dedication rarely matched in corporate American culture, Woodruff and his colleagues span the globe with their soft drink. Why is it right for people to feel that passionate about a soft drink, but not about taking Christ to the world? A soft drink is a moment on the lips. The gospel is an eternity on the hips and everywhere else. Thank you for that. (laughs) The Great Commission is Christ's final command to us to go and make disciples, to share the good news with the world. You know, the story of the church reminds me in some ways of the Tower of Babel. God told the people to go and fill the earth, but they wanted to stay together. So he confused their language, and afterwards they went and filled the earth. Jesus told the disciples to go and make disciples of all nations. A few did this right away, but it was not until Christians began to suffer great persecution in Jerusalem that many of them went to fill the world with the gospel. Today, we're often afraid or embarrassed to share the good news, even in our circle of friends and with our family. You know, even clergy are sometimes timid about that. Um, Evangelist J. John from the United Kingdom has an intriguing way to present the good news by describing his occupation. And while he's talking about being a pastor, I believe that this actually applies for all Christians. Take a listen. People often say to me, they say, J. John, you know, what, what do you do? It's always very difficult to know what to say. Because if I say to you that I'm a reverend, which I am, that conjures up certain images in people's minds as to what I might be. So I like to be a little bit creative in telling people what I do. I sat next to this lady on an aeroplane at Heathrow Airport. And I said, hello. And she said, well, hello. And I said, where are you going? And she says, I'm going to Singapore. Then she said to me, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Australia. I said, what do you do? So she told me. Then she said, what do you do? And I said, well, (laughs) I work for a global enterprise. She said, do you? I said, yes, I do. I said, we've got outlets in nearly every country of the world. She said, have you? I said, yes, we have. I said, we've got hospitals and hospices and homeless shelters. I said, we do marriage work. We've got orphanages. We've got feeding programs, educational programs. I said, we do all sorts of justice and reconciliation things. I said, basically, we look after people from birth to death, and we deal in the area of behavioral alteration. She went, wow. And it was so loud, her wow. Loads of people turned around and looked at us. She says, what's it called? I said, it's called the church. follower of Jesus, then we are part of a global enterprise, but not only is it global, it's intergalactic, because it includes everyone that's gone before us. Wow. (laughs) Remember, you serve as an ambassador for a global enterprise that helps people from the womb to the tomb with education Counseling, health care, and retirement benefits are out of this world. Who doesn't want to be part of that? Now, don't wait for God to nudge you in a tangible way. Go and make disciples of Jesus Christ today. Please join me in prayer. Almighty God, you have given your church a mission. You have given us the most important mission that ever was, to freely share the love of Jesus with all the world so that people will believe in him and be saved. Help us to learn to love you with all all our hearts, with all our minds, and with all our strength, so we can teach others the way. May we all 
May all we do bring glory and honor to your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If you will please stand and join us in singing our hymn of response, Freely, Freely. That would be good. Since that's the word you're going to say. word of benediction and blessing. God has called us to change the world by first loving God and obeying his commands, and then by loving others and sharing God's love with him. That seems hard, but it's not, because within this global enterprise, we have the power of the Holy Spirit, the grace of Jesus Christ our Lord, and the love of God that enables us to share with everyone we meet. Know God this day and go out and make him known. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.